Hello, everyone. Good morning uh, or good afternoon from wherever, uh, whichever coast you are joining us from. Uh, definitely would love to thank you uh, for joining us today on this presentation on important research uh, released this morning about Gen Z Hispanics in STEM. My name is Carlos Zavala. I'm with Whiteboard Advisors. Uh, truly honored to have the pleasure to work with the, uh, with the team and everyone on today. Uh, to bring you this presentation that is so timely uh, during this time and, uh, in COVID and the pandemic that is affecting education, workforce, and pretty much our community overall. Uh, today we have a great presentation set up for you to share more insights about what uh, we found in, the, in our community in relations to STEM and how it affects the job pipeline. Uh, today what uh, who we have is uh, first and foremost is the president and CEO of the Hispanic Heritage Foundation, Antonio Tijerino, uh, who will help lead us today uh, in our conversation. Uh, joining him is Dr. Michael Kahn of the Student Research Foundation, who headed this research uh, and helped uh, find, uh, help us with the findings here. Uh, also joining us is uh, Hector Mujica, the regional manager at Google.org, who brings just an, a great amount of insight into uh, economic opportunity and the access to jobs, uh, as well as uh, one of the foremost people I've enjoyed uh, talking to in the uh, past weeks is uh, Luna Ramirez. Uh, she's a CTE teacher and work-based learning coordinator over at the Information Technology High School uh, in Queens, uh, New York. So, and she's also an adjunct professor at the Queensboro Community College. So someone who is knee deep in this topic of number one, engaging students and, you know, kind of how do we get them through that, um, that, that, that threshold and, and, and help them succeed. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and I'd like to kick it off over to uh, Antonio uh, so he can get us started. Thank you all for joining us and thank you Carlos and Whiteboard Advisors for putting this Zoom event together and of course my staff led by Andres. It would not have taken place without you. We're looking forward to sharing the Hispanics in STEM catalyzing aspirations into representation a research that was conducted by the Student Research Foundation in partnership with the Hispanic Heritage Foundation and Google.org. A big thank you to Michael Cohn and Deborah Dodson and the Student Research Foundation for sharing your research and expertise with us. My uncle was a carpenter when I was a kid and I used to help him out with projects and he would always say, you measure carefully to make sure what you cut is effective. And that's exactly what this research allows us as educators, administrators, mentors, corporations and governments, and especially educational and workforce development institution. This research allows us to cut or strategize a pr and program plan better and more effectively going forward. Besides the data that's being presented, the research demands action. Collectively, our mandate is to play a bigger role in supporting our students in STEM and build confidence. I've always said that all of us are motiva motivated by feeling special. Good things and bad things can happen, but ultimately, we're searching a way to be special. And we need to feel a lot of children feel special about their STEM interests from a very young age, which will lead to STEM paths. But this study finds that one of the biggest interventions is building confidence. The STEM fields are missing out on a lot of Latino and African American and female and other underrepresented communities, native talent, because of a lack of confidence and preparation, not a lack of aspiration or potential. Evidence-based interventions to retain more Hispanics in the STEM pipeline can help more students achieve their dreams, provide the United States with talent to fill these STEM jobs, and maximize America's potential to leverage our unique advantage in global competition. And, and that advantage is our diversity. We need that diversity in, in order to move forward. I'd like to thank Google.org and my compadre, Hector, Mujica, who has been a long partner of my organization and last year challenged us to reach 100,000 underrepresented students and teach them how to code. And by the way, it always helps when somebody challenges you and then supports that challenge with a million dollar grant. Thank you, Hector, for everything you've done. Um, he knows that we can't wait for COVID crisis to pass because we're in an educational crisis. 
according to the Brookings Institute, students lose up to 30% of their school year learning over two months of summer vacation. And with Latino and African American students, it's at an even higher rate. Because of the COVID crisis, students will have been out of school for up to six months. And that's if school opens up in the summer. I mean, in the fall, semester after summer. Again, we can't afford to wait to take action. And that's why this week, we just launched a series of free week-long Coded Second Language virtual camps, which will run throughout the summer in partnership with Google.org. The camps were designed to continue to educate underserved students at home during the COVID-19 crisis while introducing them to tech or career paths. And also, we're offering parents some relief as they deal with not only the health and the financial, but also an educational catastrophe that we're living through and witnessing. We have been focused on the mental health aspect of this crisis on our community, and that includes our students, parents, and teachers. And yes, parents and teachers are on the front lines of this crisis too. It's an honor to have Luna Ramirez join us on the panel. We actually recognized Luna with our Innovative Educator Award in 2016, and she's continued to make an impact on her students and communities. And I look forward to hearing how she and other teachers in the country are tackling how this pandemic has affected education. Again, the research is only as effective as the actions we take. So stay tuned for an effort that we're developing at Hispanic Heritage Foundation with our partners to fill the gaps discovered by this research. And with that being said, let me hand it off to Michael for a high level presentation of the data that we found. Thank you very much, Tony. Appreciate it. Today, uh, Tony, you did a great job of framing up what we're about to speak of. The data are from the 2017-2018 school year, and they're very interesting, and I believe that a lot of the findings still hold today, but in the context of the pandemic that we're going through, I'm very interested to hear what the panelists and what all of you have to say in the Q&A about how we move forward. And when we're talking about STEM fields, we're talking about a wide variety of different occupations in aviation, biological sciences, IT and computer science, coding, cybersecurity, environmental studies, chemistry, and so forth. So it's a, a very broad sweeping area. And what we're interested in doing is helping students, high school students, their families, and their educators to continue having conversations with the students about their career paths looking ahead and what kind of educational path that will take. All right, so um, the study that I'm about to talk of involved over 16,000 high school students and of those six uh, nationwide, and of those 4,400 were, over 4,400 were Hispanic students. So let's talk about, I'm having a little trouble advancing my slide here, Tony. So why does this matter? Why does it all matter now? And what are the opportunities ahead to strengthen our nation and our workforce, particularly in light of this pandemic? Back in 2018, we were looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which showed overall job growth of 5.2% by 2028. Now, of course, in this time, that, may, that has already changed. So while these stats don't hold, there's a point that's coming up that is important to know. Back in those projections, STEM growth was predicted to be much stronger than overall growth and in the midst of this pandemic, we're seeing kind of a mix of what's happening, but there are many STEM fields that are very relevant and are taking off. And also during the last recession or right after the last recession of 2008, 2009, STEM fields, STEM occupations were the ones that rebounded the most quickly and also accelerated the most quickly. So that's likely to happen again for a lot of reasons that you would all know, and we can anticipate that going forward. There's a national need for prepared workforce, as we know, for students to come in skilled. And today's students are tomorrow's workforce. In the current workforce among adults, Hispanics compose 17% of the overall workforce, while only 8% of the STEM workforce. Now that STEM number has been gradually going up, so there has been some success 
but you can see there's still a, a lot of ground to make up. And this is a loss of a tremendous potential for our country. Among K through 12 students, Hispanics compose 25% of the student body at this point and about 20 to 21% of high school students. So it's vital for our future that we make sure that we're reaching all the talent possible. When we did our survey, there were two points of convergence between um, what Hispanic student, high school students had to say and what students from historically overrepresented groups had to say, and that's whites and Asians. And the reason why I call them historically overrepresented is I'm referring to the workforce, the STEM workforce, and who the people were that, that have been in that workforce in the past. So let's take a look at the two convergences. The first one is that as many Hispanics as whites and Asians like STEM subjects, we asked a question where we asked the students to check off their favorite STEM subject. There were, were some that did not check any, but overall there's a vast majority that do have a favorite STEM subject. And then the aspiration is there. So the, des the desire, the aspiration, and the inclination towards STEM is there. However, what we also saw in the survey data were four points of divergence. And what this chart shows here is in the upper left, we're talking about seniors in high school who have taken seven or more STEM courses. And I'll talk in a minute about why that's really important. On the upper right is an icon that rep represents high STEM confidence. On the lower right is self-reported GPA. And on the lower left is what percentage of students aspire to community college as their next step and that was among high school seniors. So let's break it down. Uh, seven or more STEM courses has been one of those cut points that's been shown to really make a difference in how students can fare in post-secondary education. If you haven't co gotten quite that many courses under your belt by the end of high school, it's, it's not impossible to make up in the future, but it gets much more difficult. And you can see the percentage difference here. High STEM confidence was measured by students who said they're extremely or very confident in their abilities in the STEM arena. And I think the stats speak for themselves here, and Tony was referring to that before. Self-reported GPA, you also see a difference. And once again, this can affect students going forward in post-secondary uh, post education and what their pathways will be, which institutions they may apply to. And you can see it starts to sort out some differences. And then finally, community college aspirations. This is a question that was, uh, you know, we drew the data from seniors only. More Hispanics are saying they intend to go to community college than whites or Asians. They also could have checked off another choice in terms of post-secondary ed. And this, as I know Tony knows, this is a, this is a complicated picture because community college can, can be a great avenue towards um, a STEM career, either as an end degree in itself, I see Luna nodding because she teaches at one, <laughs> uh, or as a pathway to continuing education. Um, it's also complicated, as you know, Luna, I mean, I've read a lot of articles about your institution that many of those students are also working full time, have complex home lives, uh, have issues with articulation with a four-year school. So I'll leave that for Luna to speak to later, what that difference means. Now, Hispanic females merit special attention, and I'll tell you why. First of all, Hispanic females are more likely to say they're A students than Hispanic males. And this is a pattern that we've, we see in general with gender differences across racial and ethnic groups. But there's also another pattern that we see, and you'll see it coming up. Even though more girls are likely to be A students than the boys among Hispanics, fewer of them say they have a favorite STEM subject, so they're, they're going into other fields. Their STEM career aspirations, checking off a future career that's related to STEM is much lower. And then as Tony mentioned before, this is the real kicker, not as likely to be highly confident in their STEM capabilities, even though they performed better than males in class. And I see Luna nodding again. So I 
I think Luna will have a lot to say about this. So in summary, that's a quick breakdown of our research um, on, all our, on both our websites. We have the report posted. You can go in. There's a lot more detail in there. I tried to keep it short, even though I'm a researcher. I tried to keep it short for you. And now I'd like to turn it back to Tony and the panel to discuss further and take it forward. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. So let me jump back to the panel. Um, and by the way, I just have to say, as somebody that was actually recruited by a lot of top universities and ended up at University of Maryland, I went to community college and it was uh, an amazing experience because um, of everything from affordability to transition, um, all the things that I was going through in my life at that time, I don't, it wouldn't have been a good fit to go directly into a four-year school, even though I graduated with honors from a four-year school. So just a clap for community college and how important, the important role that they play. So let me start then with um, just a few minutes from each of the two of you in terms of your key observations about the research and your thoughts on how COVID-19 has magnified these findings. Uh, Luna, you want to go first? Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Michael, for <laughs> uh, pointing out those big percentages of difference among our population. And yes, I have a couple of things to say about that. Um, I have, a, you know, while Michael was talking about, I remember clearly a student uh, about 12 years ago, Gloria was her name. and. Uh, I'm not gonna say last name, but Gloria came into my classroom with a very high GPA. Um, I teach a career and technology education program, a tier into web design and programming, computer programming, computer software. And she was put in the class because she was a high, you know, high performance student. <laughs> and she said that she was going to be interested. And at some point she was struggling and I approach her and I ask her, what do you think is happening? Oh, miss, you know, I like this, but you know, I'm not gonna go into this. And I say, why not? If you like it, if you're good at it, why not? Please, miss, look at me. Like, I'm looking. I'm a girl. And I'm a Latina. There are other things expected of me. And that leads me to the first thing that I wanted to talk about is when I introduce myself to my students for the first time, I make it that it's personal. I introduce myself, I tell them my life trajectory. I'm also a girl, I'm also Latina. And it wasn't expected for me to be going into this field. You know, uh, I had learning disabilities and very poor environment and teachers told my mother, just teach her how to be pretty clean and wash dishes so she can find a good husband. I remember that conversation and it astounded me, it, it surprised me that years later, almost 40 years later, a student in my classroom was being told the same thing. So one of the things that I recommend teachers doing is Talk about your path to get where you are, right? Tell them what were the hardships that you passed through and how you survived them and how happy you are that you never gave up. Um, so make it per personal. That was one of the things. The, the other thing that I like to do with my students is set high expectations for them. <laughs> don't believe that, don't transmit that, oh, because you are a minority, I'm going to have to make it easier for you. The students are not expecting that from you. The students are expecting respect and for you to treat them like everybody else. So when you set them with high expectations and you tell them, this is what I expect you to do, they try to achieve it. And when they are starting to go and do that at pass, they don't have to meet the high expectations before you come and approach them and say, wow, good job, you're in the right path. 
that notch, like, oh, okay, I should go, I should keep going, I should keep going. So that is also very, very important in the classroom. Uh, I like to introduce them to professionals in the field that um, look like them, talk like them, and they can talk about the experiences because I can make it personal, but after so long with Miss Ramirez, oh, she's like my mom. I stopped listening to her. She's a unique case, right? And they stop listening to you. But when you start showing them other people who are successful in the field, and they can also relate to them in like, oh, I remember how school was tough. I remember, you know, I'm a Latino, I'm a woman. Show them people who are successful in, in their field. Um, I, even through this time, I was very fortunate to have connected with Nuevo Foundation. Uh, they link you into with Hispanic mentors or, or mentors across computer science field uh, to either come to your classroom or show in a webinar like, a, like we're doing today and talk to the students and have a Q&A or teach them something unique. And, when the student says that like, oh, so Ms. Ramirez wasn't talking crazy. This is actually happening outside the classroom. This is real because that's the other thing you want to do. Make what you are teaching relevant and real in the outside mm -hmm. world. That is not just in the classroom. No, it's not just for a grade that I'm getting this. Show them that what they're learning, the grade is not the biggest reward the biggest reward is the knowledge they're getting because they are going to get more opportunities more initiative you know more incentive to go into the field right um i i was um uh, very surprised in an interview these days the miss universe who is uh from i think it's nigeria it's uh from africa and she won me in this universe with her own hair and looking, you know, uh, African American, and everybody's like, "Oh, you have an advantage." Everybody said that, you know, because you're a minority, you have. Like, since when in history, being a minority has been an advantage for anybody, right? It's not because she was black or because she was using her short natural hair. It's because she was willing to take the risk is because she was willing to do the work. And that's the same thing with a STEM or any other field. If you are willing to work hard for it, if you are willing to do whatever it takes to achieve your dreams, you will get there. And as a teacher, my job is to keep telling as soon as I believe in you, you have a bright future. I think this is where you're going. And I have another student who, always told me, I'm taking your class, I'm doing good, but don't worry, Ms. Ramirez, I'm gonna be a veterinarian. I'm gonna be a veterinarian. She joined the vet school, and after a year in college, she said like, no, and she changed into web design, computer science, and now she's her own uh, entrepreneur. She has her own business, and she wrote me years later, saying like, you told me I could do it in here. You believe in me. I kept thinking about the other stuff that my parents wanted me to do. I went in there and I wasn't being successful. And then when I went into this field, because of those seven and a half credits or 10 credits that I got in CTE during high school with you, I was able to succeed. I graduated top of my class in computer science and now I have my own company. And those are the kind of things like, that also motivate me. It's like, oh, what I'm doing is working. Let's keep doing it. So. It is important that we give kudos to the students as they go along. Um, uh, Michael also mentioned about the community colleges. And this is a big deal for me because uh, my high school is mostly Title I. A lot of my students are minority. And there's a stigma among students. First, that they are not expected to go to a big Ivy League college. Parents tell them, I cannot afford for you to go for IV, IV college. So they go ahead and don't apply to them. And it's a steep fight for me to tell them, 
apply to whatever you think you can, you want to go, right? There are opportunities, there are scholarships, there are grants, there are ways for you to get there, even if your parents don't have the save, right? Um, and it's a very big battle, you know, because my mom is telling me one thing, but Ms. Ramirez believes that I can do this. So that's uh, also, we are, uh, we were talking about COBOL coming back. We have a, as a human race, we have a problem with change. And the reason the COBOL is back is because the educational system and a lot of the companies based software right now is built on COBOL. And when we needed to transition so fast from, you know, real life into a virtual remote work and learning environment, a lot of platforms crash and you needed people who will race to the challenge and troubleshoot COBOL. So we were calling back retirees to join the work field to teach us COBOL because we were afraid to move on into new technology. So tell them not to be afraid, that tell them that they can be the change. And yes, you are right, Michael and Anthony. I teach in a community college. I went to a community college. It's a great, a great trampoline for the students to start off uh, their educational path, the career path. Um, they save money. They get as good education as the Ivy luggage, uh, college, colleges because I have peers in my department that teach us an adjunct in QCC, but they are full-time in Ivy League colleges. So they get the same good education. Um, and yes, a lot of them need the, the flexibility of the community college because they need to work and they need to attend yeah. to the younger siblings and they need to do the, um, so it's a great platform. And most of them continue with it, continue no, to a four year. Thank you, Luna. And I actually was recruited by Brown University and went to a community college and then ended up at University of Maryland. And uh, just for the record, I do all the cleaning and cook and the cleaning of dishes and cooking in my house. So um, I just want to go over to a guy who's recently married and should learn to cook and clean <laughs> as well in his house. Um, Hector, uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the, the same question in terms of observations about the research and then jump right into how COVID-19 has, has uh, completely put everything um, at stake. Uh, we're now dealing not just with the crisis we're in, but post-crisis, it's still a crisis. And how do we go forward from here in terms of, um, in, in terms of the STEM fields? Yeah, happy to, Tony. Um, first of all, definitely as a newlywed, having to, having to live in the reality of COVID, picking up the cooking skill sets rather quickly. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's been a, a new skill set for me. But um, Luna, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge and, and thank you for, for sharing some of your perspectives around the power of mentorship, the power of, of being able to see yourself and somebody else see yourself reflected in somebody else and then that how that unleashes potential um, and also the power of making it real and taking risks. I think that those are uh, three lessons that we can apply across the board and I, and I appreciate your perspective on that. Um, I want to share a few perspectives and a few observations that we're seeing on the corporate philanthropy side in tech at google.org in the context of COVID and also in the context of STEM and STEM careers and pathways to the digital economy. So the, the first one is that we are definitely seeing that Latinos are disproportionately impacted by the realities of COVID. Uh, we know that Latinos are overrepresented in industries such as the service industry that is currently being deeply impacted by COVID. We also know that as a result of that, less than one in five black workers and roughly one in six Latino workers are able to work from home, which is a reality that most folks are facing and having to, to deal with right now, yielding massive, you know, unforeseen numbers of unemployment. Um, and by extension, I think there's definitely a correlation between that number of folks that can 
work remotely, work from home, and also the number of folks that are in STEM careers or in computer science fields. Because uh, then the, the other observation that we, that we can point to is that Latinos are also disproportionately underrepresented in, in STEM careers. We know that black workers make up about 12% of all workers domestically, but only about 8% of tech workers. And that gap is even larger for Latinos who make up about 17% of all workers um, domestically, but only about 7% of, of tech workers across the board. So as we try to project and forecast what the future of work is going to look like, most indications, most research seem to point to the future of work being digital. There being a high demand for flexibility, there being a high demand for technical knowledge, technical comfort, and, um, and also having a background and a foundation in STEM related fields. And that's, that's been made particularly clear during this time of COVID, that we are a society that is increasing is interdependence with technology and the the future of the economy truly will continue to shift and move in a pathway towards bringing us closer to a digital revolution um whether it be for education and distance learning whether it be for healthcare coordination or for simple things like safely and remotely being able to shop and access groceries etc we know that the digital economy is going to be um, a new reality and i think we all need to adapt to this new reality and make sure that our community is adequately represented in designing and creating this digital economy and designing and creating the solutions and the, the tools and, and um, the mechanisms that will ultimately shape the economy of tomorrow, especially because we are going to be a significant portion of the consumers of tomorrow. And we shouldn't only be consumers of technology, but also developers of technology. And um, one thing that's been really clear for me for the report is that there's a clear affinity um, and openness from the Latino community to STEM, STEM students really feeling um, deep interest across the board towards STEM related subjects, but confidence and access and pathways continue to be limiting factors um, for entering these STEM fields. And then when you overlay that with some of the realities that we're seeing in COVID, most of the, co most of the changes that we're seeing across the board in industries as a result of COVID are here to stay. Some of the, the iterations around leaning into automation, leading, leaning into technology, that is all here to stay. And that's gonna be part of the new fabric of our economy going forward. Therefore, it's as important as ever to ensure that the Latino community um, whether they're currently in school, whether their job seekers have been displaced that are now looking for ways to upskill, um, it's important for them to prepare and take the right steps to find that confidence, increase that level of access, and rebuild the pathways to, for them to enter the digital economy. Thank you, Hector. And so let me ask a just really quickly, Michael, if you can give us your um, thoughts in terms of how COVID-19 has magnified uh, these findings that, that, that you have been working on for a few years, how has this changed the feel of those findings in terms of going forward in, in, from this pandemic on? I think there are a few things that both Hector and Luna spoke to that are relevant, and one is uh, right now, distance learning and remote learning is what st students are having to do, and we know there are differences among different populations and access to that. So that's one. That's a, that's a negative. On the positive side, um, what Luna was speaking to about, the, there's an opportunity here to, to encourage and mentor and, and demonstrate what's possible going forward. And because students are online, I think there's even more opportunities to connect them with other resources. I, I heard someone the other day who's a specialist, a well-known person in the youth development field, who was saying that now education and out-of-school time program have kind of become blended. It's almost like they're the same thing. So there's opportunities to get involved with projects, with other people, folks who might be outside of what would have been in your school building. And I've also seen a lot of educators drawing from those resources more actively because they're looking for activities 
to work with students. So that's just a few observations I have. I wonder how, what Luna and Hector would think of that as well. Um, well, let so me go back to Luna and ask you the question because we have about 20 minutes left and I, I wanna be able to keep it tight. Um, so as a teacher, and I think this feeds into what Michael was prompting you to do. As a teacher, what are some of the strategies that you're implementing in your classroom before the pandemic and how has that changed? Um, the, the big question, and I'm asking as a parent, because I've got kids, some that are in a lab school because they have learning challenges, um, ADHD and, and, and dyslexia, and the other kid that's in uh, a, a really good school district in public schools and I cannot believe the lack of resources and education that's happening right now. It's completely um, stunted. So what do you think need, changes need to be made as teachers prepare for the next school year in this new normal, as well as what are you doing right now to reach out to your kids? So one thing that I always have done is that when my student gets accepted into my class, right? And I say it accepted is because these are elective credits, but I made them make sure that they want to take it because if you want something you achieve it right that's the most important thing so they apply they, they go into interviews um we put them in a classroom and i tell them you're almost there but i need your parents here i need your parents to come to a meeting listen to me know what i'm expecting of you know what i'm demanding of you and i need you and your parents to sign this contract that you are committed to complete all 10 CTE credits and you are committed to do the best it can take and the parents come and the parents get engaged. And of course, you're gonna have students uh, from the low GPA to high GPA in there. Uh, I'm dyslexic, I have ADHD, so I know what you're talking about. Um, my students, every time they start going like, oh, I'm gonna quit, this is too hard, too much work. You ask me more work than my English teacher or my math teacher. I tell them, wait a minute, remember this is what you wanted. This is not me, this is what you wanted. You sign a contract. So I always have done reaching parents. What I'm doing more now is that I'm doing more outreach to parents. And I keep telling the parents, it has been always a teamwork you know, for the benefit of the student. It's me, the student, and you. We are a community and we're all working towards their future to help them get there. And parents said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But sometimes the parents in my high school kind of detach and they assume the students already know the routines. They assume the students are self-disciplined, can't manage time, and they haven't learned those skills yet. They have to put them into practice. So what remote learning has prompted me was calling parents and say, I need your help. I gave them an assignment to create a specific schedule to make sure that they weren't working in the bed. Even if they make a small working station inside a closet, it's better than working on the bed. Because, you know, Pavlov was very smart. If your body has gone to bed every day to sleep, if you go to the with a computer to work in the bed, your body's gonna think asleep, right? And that leads me to the next thing, right? Students, sometimes it's hard for them to see the big picture, the long-term picture, and they only see a grade. Oh, my mom be happy, right? So I know that the knowledge is gonna get them there. Uh, and the most important word that I offer them is extra credit. You know, a lab that is important skill might be, oh yeah, I'll, I'll leave it for later, I'll leave it for later. But if I tell them extra credit, if you do ABC, they see that like, whoa, a treasure. And they go for it. And then when they go for it, they go back to the lab and say, like, I'm gonna do this lab because it's gonna help me get this lab. So that's the scene, find something, like when you train the puppy to, you know, to follow along, give them the little treat. After a while, the students are gonna say like, I don't need the treat, I don't need the compliment, I know where this is going. But at the beginning, you have to give them some kind of incentive to get there. Thank you, that's great. And, and Hector, 
given the findings of the report and your work at google.org around economic opportunity and and you know and i know google the company in terms of access to jobs i know you guys do different things over at google.org what can employers and stakeholders do uh, to help transition um, these these interests in stem into actually career paths and the work that we're doing is to to light a spark, you know, a chispa uh, in terms of teaching them and introducing them to coding. And then, of course, we hand it off to people like Luna, and then it gets handed off to you once, once they're in the industry. So what is that, that follow-up that needs to happen? I know we're doing it through our programs that we try to break it out so that there's steps along, the, along that path. But if you could talk a little bit about what employers and other stakeholders can do, and I know we have some of them on this. I saw Alma's on here from General Motors and others that partner with us. Happy to, Tony. Um, so there's a, you know, I think there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm going to focus on three, three buckets. Um, I think a couple of them are going to speak to more the philanthropic community and what we can be doing, where, where we can be investing, how we can be thinking about broaching some of the gaps that exist and getting this content out to communities. And the third one, I think, is going to speak more directly to employers and some of the opportunities that we have um, as employers to change some of our practices and, and, and look at the hiring process a little bit differently. But um, so I think to start off, the first one that I want to speak to, and I think this one I definitely want to highlight because this point to the work that we've been doing with Hispanic Heritage Foundation, with the YWCA, with Unidos, is um, the work around supporting culturally relevant solutions for the community. We know that Black and Latino students often find themselves missing from common representation on who gets to study computer science in particular, not to mention the other, the other fields of study in STEM. Um, if we segment that further and we look at students that are uh, Spanish speaking Latino students or English as a second language students, they're facing additional barriers and additional challenges in being able to access that content. We've done an audit of existing coding content across the board that's publicly and readily available. And for every three sets of English resources and content. There's only one comparable set of content for, for Spanish content. So there's already a handful of barriers that, that exist. And um, that's why we've been working proactively with these organizations um, around these three, with a three-pronged approach around three different components. First, in term is increasing the exposure and opportunities to engage with, with computer science. So what are ways that we can be ensuring that we can bring, be bringing this content more proximate to communities where that content is lacking. The second, um, and this actually reminds me, Luna, of your point that I really appreciated in terms of engaging the whole parent, the whole, the whole family unit um, and engaging the parents in the, in, in the conversation as well. Um, that also ties really nicely to the second point, which is a holistic approach that, um, that engages the students, the parents, and the educators in the computer science journey, um, both in the classroom and after school, knowing that, again, parents are a huge uh, component of the studying and career journey of many, many young Latinos across, across the nation. And the third is doing all of this, again, with content that provides adequate cultural context, allowing families to engage in the conversation. And uh, that adequate cultural context can be language, like I mentioned already. It can be um, having people that are actually dictating the courses that are brown and black, people that look like the individuals that are consuming the content and can see themselves in these roles, right? Kind of going back to, to your point earlier, Luna, as well, in terms of being able to see individuals that look like them, that come from backgrounds similar to them, that are now in these roles, in these companies, in these capacities that they can aspire to enter, I think sends a, sends a really strong signal. Um, the second component that I wanna, that I wanna mention is um, the importance of supporting uh, equitable access for all, regardless. I, I think that's also one of the recommendations that comes out of this report. I think it's framed something around re access regardless of zip code. But um, I think that's incredibly important, something that we keep anchoring on. For example, if you look at the Latino student population in California and computer science as a segmentation, um, 
who see that having an overall majority, the majority of the student body in California is, is Latino. Latinos, Latino students have the lowest participation rate in AP computer science courses out of any group in the state of California. I believe the average is around 53% and Latinos are only at 15, 15%. So, and we see similar trends for, for other communities like, uh, like the black community and others. So, and, and this gets augmented in, for students in high poverty or high min minority schools where they're much more likely to have a science teacher or any kind of STEM field teachers that have less than two years of experience versus their counterparts in other schools. Um, so we know that these are uh, these are definitely mechanics that are augmenting the the issue. Um, and you know, there's different different solutions, different ways to tackle it. One solution that we're tackling right now at Google.org, in collaboration with K4 Center and Equal Opportunity Schools and a handful of other partners, is an initiative called Rising STEM Scholars, which is an initiative to to get more students of color into advanced placement STEM classes across across the Bay Area. So that that was an initial pilot that we were experimenting with in the Bay Area. So far, one year into the pilot, that has resulted in doubling the number of Black and Latino students taking AP CS courses across various schools in the Bay Area, uh, which we see that as a tremendous signal of success and something that we definitely want to continue to scale and, and expand on. And, um, and the third component that I mentioned earlier, and I think this one speaks more to, more to pathways to employment and more of a direct call out to, um, to employers and other stakeholders in the space is investment in an acceptance of alternate career paths. Um, employers across the board really need to focus on changing the way that they screen candidates. Uh, they need to change their definition of a traditional candidate to be more inclusive of non-traditional backgrounds, whether it be community colleges or whether it be other non-traditional backgrounds such as folks that are now taking certification courses or boot camps or other type of programs. I know for Google, this is definitely an active conversation that we're trying to assess uh, with our counterparts at, from Google.org and in the staffing organization within Google Inc. and others, really trying to encourage a new way and a new approach um, to hiring and to really looking at the holistic profile of a candidate, not just whether they went to a four-year university and have a four-year degree or not. So definitely there's, there's a, a call to action there for, for employers, for major companies to be actively rethinking the way that they, they screen candidates and the way that, uh, what, the way that they pressure test and measure different components. And, um, and employers and, and stakeholders must also invest in making these programs, uh, at, whether at community colleges or at non-traditional certificates, online certificates, more accessible and more robust. Uh, at the end of the day, we, we as companies and as employers, we know the type of skill sets that we're looking for. So we can and we should be investing in these programs, in these community colleges to make sure that we're creating adequate learning and adequate pathways to jobs. Um, Google.org, for example, is investing in tools like the Google IT Professional Support Certificate or the Python Support Certificate and embedding these certificates have been developed in-house by Google with the skill sets that we know an individual must have to be able to land an IT related role at a company like Google and, um, and making sure that we infuse that content into out through organizations, community and nonprofit organizations, out through community colleges. We actually just um, just recently announced a, a new partnership with Miami Dade College, uh, which is the nation's largest Hispanic serving institution, to be able yes. to get this embedded into there. And we're also working on exploring solutions around apprenticeships, and, which are also another emerging form of non traditional education where you can be learning while also working and earning an income, which I know for our community is huge. Um, we just need to be more conscious and actively investing in more efforts like these. Thank you, Hector. I, I just want to point to a couple of things. Among African-American and Latino students, those who take APCS in, in high school are up to eight times more likely to take CS in college, according to code.org. That is a huge statistic. I'll read it over again. Among African-American and Latino students that take AP. Um, uh, computer science courses in high school, they're eight times, not twice, eight times more likely to take computer science in college. 
Um, the other thing I want to mention is the cultural relevancy in language and everything else. We were working with Infosys Foundation USA on a program that is uh, coding in Spanish, um, CSL and Espanol. Uh, it's more important than ever that we um, meet our students where they need us to meet them as opposed to them having to come over to how we're teaching. And, and you have to be flexible in, in that as well. And last thing, just commend Hector and for as a as a partner that um, that made sure that we were leveraging our strengths and benefiting from the strengths of another organizations in our partnership with the YWCA in doing this program uh, we've been able to to leverage their amazing um, community um, uh, resources that they have across I think something like 200 and and 30 or 220 um, uh, different YWCA's around the country and their leader Alejandra Castillo has worked with us um, arm in arm in making sure that, that, that we're both uh, being more effective in terms of what we're doing. And um, so just, I appreciate that google.org uh, had that grant that was connected to us working with other organizations which is what we need to do. It also helps when it's an organization that you greatly admire, like Unidos and like the YWCA and, and have those relationships. So um, I think we're close to just taking some questions and, and answers. And Carlos, do you have any that, that, that um, any one of the three panelists and you as well want to um, answer? Sure. Um, Kiki uh, Lizarraga shared uh, a question with us and she asks, how does upskilling fit into this conversation? How can we be ahead of the industry in anticipating the most valuable digital skills? How can students adjust educational plan in real time to be taking the most relevant courses either through university or seeking out other programs? Please go ahead. Let's just be close so we can type okay, so, so that we can uh, try to get so to a couple of these. I, I, I really like this question. So when I, so I, said, I, I like to answer live because everybody should hear this. Uh, like the Boy Scouts tell the kid, oh, you're going to get this badge if you do this. You know, if you do the campfire, you get the campfire badge. And if you get these 10 badges, now you are an uh, eagle or whatever, right? It's the same thing that we do in the classroom. And I want to say Hector, Hector because uh, he was telling me, he was telling us all about this initiative, CS for All, uh, Equal Opportunity, Holistic Approach. And what I tell my students is like, I'm not really teaching you computer science. I'm teaching you critical thinking, problem solving, perseverance, yeah. not getting, not giving up when you get frustrated, but thinking, and in open mind setting. And these are the missions and the goals of the big companies like Google, right? There is not a problem that cannot be solved. There's always a way to solve it. And if you say it cannot be done, of course it cannot be done because you already determined that it couldn't. But if you have the mindset of, yes, it can, then you get to find a solution. It might not be the perfect solution, is more a heuristic approach, but then you get to that solution and then you improve on it. You iterate it until you go better and better at it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, with the topic of uh, how to anticipate the digital skills, because the digital skills that you need actually haven't been invented yet. You cannot really study them, but you can get the <laughs> skills to succeed at whatever comes next. Problem solving, critical thinking. And with a bachelor's degree, you know, a lot of, I was reading the chat room, it's like a lot of students aspire for a bachelor's degree, but doesn't mean that you have to start there. You see a person that starts in a bachelor's degree and a student that goes out of high school with seven CT college credits and gets into the work field and a community college. They start moving up. And because they want to get paid better, they keep improving. They keep improving. This person, in as soon as they come out, they are in here. But they stay there. They're happy. They're content. They don't aspire for anything else. This student keeps going. And at four years, maybe they are at the par. Both of them are in the same level. But this student doesn't stop there. A year later, it's higher than the other one and it's higher and it's higher and it's going beyond because that student knows and has the skills that they can be applied 
to the new thing that we don't know what is coming. I, I love that so much. I'm not teaching CS, but critical thinking, problem solving, and not giving up. That's fantastic. Um, do you want to read another question and maybe see if uh, um, Hector can take this one? Yeah. Uh, more questions are popping up. So um, then um, are there any other, uh, does HHF or Google.org offer any workshops or resources, you know, for us to do volunteer work and help back our community? Uh, and how to implement this into a more virtual summer enrichment programs to bring awareness to parents and students. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Hector in a second, but we just had this conversation where Hector reached out to me and said, listen, we've got a lot of Google employees that are ready to jump in and help with any of the virtual programs that you're doing. That's a really nice call to get. Um, and you have to understand our CODIS second language program that's now reaching 100,000 kids and across 70 um, markets across the United States started with Google volunteers in Boyle Heights, LA, seven years ago, led by our, our man, Alberto Avalos, who I think is on this call as well. So shout out to him um, and a bunch of Googlers. Um, and so uh, that is the, the basis for building something that was impossible that turns into very possible um, is to be able to have that support from a human capital not just the funding part. Um, so it, it, anyone that wants to do that, reach out to, I think some of the HHF team is on here and we can put you in touch. I mean, we're teaching coding camps um, all over the country. And it was remarkable when I posted it on Facebook that these parents were saying, they're trying to charge me $150 to do these camps. We're like, no, everything's free and everything is everywhere. And now people are calling saying, how can I help with these? How can I teach one in, in my community? Because different, and we're getting a lot of outreach from teachers saying, my kids are at home doing nothing. Can I just tell them about your program? Absolutely. And you can also come up with ideas. At Hispanic Heritage Foundation, I promise you, if you have an idea, we'll execute it within a week. Um, so I'll turn it over to Hector because I'm sure he's got even broader opportunities for people to help. Yeah. Um, thanks, Tony. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I think, I mean, first of all, commend Tony and the work of the Hispanic Heritage Foundation across the board. I mean, uh, it, we've been collaborating and scheming uh, together for, <laughs> for over eight years now, starting with this coding as a second language work and seeing where it's developed and seeing how, how much it's grown is in no small part due to Tony's passion and his perseverance and patience um, with, with all of this. So thank you so much for your partnership, Tony. Um, you know, I will mention really quickly, going back to Luna's point and, and her answer, I loved your points around uh, kind of the life skills and the soft skills that need to be developed overall, because these are going to be the right skill sets that are going to be then meshed up with the the evolving technologies that are going to be emerging. Um, that, that kind of reminded me of a, of a way that we've been framing and that I've been actively thinking about what the new reality of the new economy is going to look like. And it's going to be one in which we're going to be continuously learning. It's not going to be one where you get a four-year degree or an associate's or bachelor's degree and then you're done and then you can work in that profession your whole life. It's more so going to be like, like Luna was mentioning, it's going to be micro learning modules since technology is moving so quickly, evolving so quickly. There's always going to be new technologies to be adapting to and learning from. Um, so it's really going to just require that flexibility, that mindset, that ability to navigate ambiguity, that critical thinking. So really, really appreciated that. Um, the, the other piece that, that I'll mention when it comes to upskilling and in terms of resources that might be available out there, I, I will recommend um, one tool that, that we have out that one of our that, that our peers have out at Google Inc. called um, Grow with Google. The, the website's grow.google. That'll get you to the Grow with Google website. And they have a ton of resources there on digital skilling, whether it be upskilling, whether it be um, you know, setting up, a, doing some web design, whether it be support for small businesses, et cetera. So there's a plethora of resources there that, that I think would be timely and, and adequate for this. And again, I'll do another plug for the, for the Google IT professional support certificate uh, that, that that's another big tool and, and mechanism that we've rolled out now with a handful of partners whether it be goodwill perscola is a handful of others that are actively working and bringing this more proximate to to our community and happy to share more resources around that as well with the group i just want to say that uh what uh, hector just called uh soft skills that's a term that i've been for a very long 
I think we shouldn't call it soft skills because those are the be really, really important ones. So I'm gonna call them from now on power skills. Okay, those are the <laughs> ones that we want the students to have power skills. I love that. Okay, well, I think that does it, right? It was till 3.30, we're on time. And I just wanna thank the panelists. I wanna thank Michael for his work and Deborah with, that, that worked alongside of him over at the Student Research Foundation. I am hoping to do more studies with you for Generation Z. Um, it's really important that we focus on this generation. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of work with the millennials and certainly um, Generation X and baby boomers and everyone before, but Generation Z is now. Um, it's not in the future anymore. It is right now. And I also want to thank um, uh, Hector, uh, mi gran amigo, uh, stay safe. And, and Luna, just you're an inspiration. And even just hearing you now, I'm just like, no wonder we honored her a few years ago with that award. <laughs> she absolutely um, energizes us. And you talk about a call to action. Every word she says is a call to action. And Carlos, thank you, hermano. Um, you uh, and Whiteboard Advisors made all of this um, come to fruition. And so thank you everyone that's uh, in the audience. Really appreciate your participation. You have a lot of things to do. And that fact that you chose this means that you really are prioritizing the need to educate our youth and make sure that they're on track to STEM careers that'll help the country, not just the Latino community, because we offer great value to the entire country as Latinos. So thanks to everyone. Just because we're socially distancing doesn't mean we have to be alone. It was wonderful spending the last hour with you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Nice to meet you all.